say my prayers, and I know He hears them. I ask for guidance, and I feel His direction. I read His Word, and I gain wisdom. I spread His message, and I feel Him speaking through me. I get hurt, and He comforts me. I get confused, and He makes everything right again. I cannot see Him with my eyes. I cannot hear Him with my ears. I cannot touch Him with my hands. I cannot prove Him to you, but I know He's real. I know He loves me, and I know He can do anything. He is and always will be my Father, my friend, my partner, my Creator, my God. And I have been touched by His noodly appendage. He is the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Hi, welcome to Darkwood Brew, a Christian uh, television uh, internet program, but perhaps Christian broadcast television's worst nightmare. I'm Eric Elmas, your host, and Darkwood Brew is that place where we mix uh, ancient Christian mystical practices with modern interactive web technology, world-class jazz, arts, biblical scholarship, and well, you never know exactly what's going to happen. So when you go to church each Sunday, if you go to church each Sunday, do you go to meet God or the flying spaghetti monster? That may seem like a bit of an unusual question, but it's actually one that, if the, uh, that would be asked likely by the prophet Amos, uh, the 8th century uh, mystical prophet, uh, if he were alive and here uh, today. In the 8th century BCE, Israel was full of a lot of fervent wor worshipers. They uh, kept the Ten Commandments. They kept the Sabbath. They honored the Sabbath. They, they came to worship every week. They tithed. Uh, and yet, for lack of one particular thing, Amos says, all of that is out the window. You may as be well be worshiping the ancient Near Eastern equivalent of the flying spaghetti monster. Many uh, Christians, particularly on television these days, say that the answer to America's ills is to have more Christians uh, active and out there. And yet, what if Christians are missing this one thing as well? Could we be worshiping the equivalent of the flying spaghetti monster? Well, joining us to uh, help us explore that question and more, uh, once again, is Frank Schaefer, who's been the guest for our, our entire entire series. Uh, Frank is a prolific author and blogger with pa the Huffington Post and Pathos.com. Looking forward to hearing uh, uh, what, whatever Frank has to tell us tonight because he's pretty good at channeling the spirit of Amos. But before we go any further, let's take a look at what's happened so far in our series. so want to kill all the poor, sir? I don't want to do anything of the sort, but I think it's important to know if it would help. Of course it wouldn't help, but the computer says it wouldn't help, so we're not doing it. That's why we're not doing it. What? That's the only reason why we're not doing it. Bloody hell, now I'm offended. While many experienced amazing economic prosperity, the rich getting richer and the middle class even entering the rich class, uh, the poor got poorer. I'm speaking, of course, of 8th century Israel in the 8th century BCE. One of the great sad things of our own age is that the prophetic voices 
say on the environment, oh, that's a left-wing issue, so now all Republicans have to pretend there's not global warming. Human trafficking, oh, the evangelicals are upset about it because it's part of the sex industry. That must just be more prudish right-wingers. No, it's not. It's compassionate people you may not agree with politically or, or go to church with. You and I and this program and other people of goodwill have to find a way to put a moral compass back on the American discourse, free from the culture war spin. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to You them. want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! And so what does Jesus' statement that the last shall be first do to a sense of entitlement and chosenness? Well, it rewrites the entire package. meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. My, not exactly what I was expecting to see there. <laughs> so, uh, Darkwood Brew producer Scott Grissel and uh, director uh, Diana Gomez put that together. And uh, uh, just to illustrate a bit of uh, Amos uh, in his angry state, and, and that passage is actually one that we'll be going over uh, this evening as part of our Numa Divina reading from Amos chapter 5. Uh, but before we uh, get into that, uh, we are joined uh, by another special guest this evening, one uh, who many Darkwood Brewer viewers are familiar with uh, through his blogging and also through his late night chat administrating as well as his live chat uh, 5 p.m. Sunday uh, conversation. Uh, please uh, help me welcome Ian Lynch to the yeah. Darkwood Brewer studio. Thank you. And uh, Ian, you are a minister in Brimfield, Massachusetts, and you've been you've been in Darkwood Brew since pretty much the beginning of this. Yeah, I was just talking with Chris before uh, the show that um, um, the tornado that happened in in Brimfield was only six months after you started, yeah, and we right. had a, we had a strong connection by that point because it was um, I actually just reposted on our Facebook page the greeting that Countryside sent to our church right. that 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 Sunday. I mean, the tornado happened on Wednesday, and we had that on Sunday. Um, uh, connected that way. So, yeah, it's been a long time, yeah. and a long good time. The internet is definitely connecting us in ways we never even conceived of, and now connecting us physically with you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you want to tell folks what you're, what, what are you here for? <laughs> <laughs> what am I here for? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm on sabbatical right now, and um, what I really wanted to, to explore uh, with some time away from the day-to-day -day at the church was this whole idea of, of what the church may be becoming. I really do believe that 
the institutions uh, all around, all institutions uh, really are, ch are going through times of change mm -hmm. and stress. Um, the church as an institution, you know, among them. And, um, and I think we need to find new ways to be the church. Mm -hmm. And we need to find ways to be the church without walls and beyond our walls. And uh, Darkwood Brew has been something that's been church without walls because of the connection through the social media and the internet. Um, and it's something that now is beyond the walls for me. I'm, I'm here within your walls, you know. So um, I wanted to see what was going on here and, and explore that. But particularly to think about ways that the connections that we have can make us be the church. Mm. So we don't go to church, but that we become the church. Um, and we find those ways through convergence to connect with with people of different uh, churches, people of different faiths, um, all of that. And that's, that's really coming together here. So I'm, I'm enjoying the time of being able just to sit and pick people's brains, have some conversations, mm -hmm. uh, not just seeing the technical stuff, which is fascinating yeah. <laughs> to watch, watch all the work that goes on behind the scenes here. We've been telling you, pay no attention to the people behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots but, uh, of people behind the curtain. They're working hard. Lots of people behind the, the curtains, exactly. And yeah. Yeah, I think that um, you know, as the internet, even though the, the internet sometimes can put up walls by kind of putting us through our social media channels so we're only ever associating with people like us, mm -hmm. it also tends uh, in some platforms to take down walls and allows us to kind of peer across the walls at people who we never maybe had a lot of interaction with. And you mentioned just the fact that the internet is even speeding up some sense of convergence, uh, different communities who maybe have had a had their differences before, but kind of peering over the wall at each other and saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, there's some interesting things about you that I never yeah. knew before. And maybe and, you've changed and maybe I've changed too. And, and if we can find ways that, that things we have in common to make that connection and do that first and then say, oh, I do this because I believe this. Someone else might say, oh, well, I do it because I believe that. Mm -hmm. and, and we find, oh, this and that, though we thought they were so different, maybe, maybe aren't so much. Mm, different, yeah, just, um, uh, and we can really expand our circles to to uh, include more people and get more done. Because if we're not doing anything for the world, if if we're no worldly good because we're so otherworldly minded, then then we don't have the right to be God's people on this earth and be called the church. We really need to roll up our sleeves and do something. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and incidentally, if you're interested in in meeting uh, Ian in, in person uh, yourself too, and and exploring convergence, actually, there's a lot of converging and peering uh, over the walls happening this summer at the Wild Goose Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, they've moved it from Shakori Hills, North Carolina, down to a uh, 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 Hot Springs, North Carolina, just outside of Asheville. So it's actually a much more convenient location to get to. A uh, Darkwood Brew will be there in full force. We'll be actually running a coffee house there and managing the performance tent. And uh, I know you're you're coming. And we'll have about mm -hmm. about 12 uh, people from the Darkwood Brew, um, you know, active uh, participants of Darkwood Brew at least, who will be be there as well. So, uh, meet us at uh, come come out to uh, the Wild Goose Festival this this summer. You'll see us. Yeah, yeah. yeah that'll be fun. Yeah. Last year's was amazing. Uh, yeah. Anyone who's been to one can't wait to get back to the next absolutely. one. So anyone who's wondering. Is this going to be worthwhile? Do I want to go? The answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think There's about no a month after it. the last festival, I was already yeah. thinking, about, oh, we got to go. oh, come on, yeah. hurry up, hurry up, I want to get to the next yeah. one. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if there are any cows around there. <laughs> <laughs> there must be cows. See, down why there would you bring up cows? cows? Let me cows. think about this a second. Cows. Uh, yeah. You know, beautiful, <laughs> lovely cows. It's, it's a compliment to, to, uh, to call someone a cow, isn't it? Actually, it can be. Believe it or not, yeah, yeah. Amos actually, uh, in uh, it, you know, some of the our Darkwood Brew viewers are kind of following along in Amos, reading through the whole chapter. And we're, I mean, the whole book, which is just nine chapters, and we're on chapter five. We've skipped chapter four, but to kind of pick up on chapter four, Amos actually addresses uh, the women of of Israel, and he calls them cows. Uh, he calls them uh, cows of Bashan, actually, in this rather incendiary passage, but it's not incendiary for the reason you may think. Let me just pull that up here, and I'll show you the passage we're referring to. Um, it says, um, the Lord God has sworn in his holiness that the time is surely... Oh, wait a minute. That's... Uh-oh. The slides kind of got rearranged here. Let me find these cows of Bashan anyway. Uh-oh. I can't find my cows of Bashan. Yeah, <laughs> the cows Where are my the cows of Bashan? <laughs> okay, don't, don't move the screen here. I can find them here. There we go. Let's try that. <laughs> yes, there we go. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, uh, who are on Mount Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands, 
Bring something to drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, the time is surely coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks and every one, last one of you with fish hooks. Through breaches of the wall they shall leave. That is, through the walls that have been breached by an enemy. Uh, each one straight ahead. And you shall be flung out into Harmon, says the Lord. And that's a pretty, pretty harsh passage. And um, we immediately take offense, though, starting from referring to women as cows of Bashan, that in our culture is a derogatory, inappropriate comment you know, regarding weight. Um, but in Amos's day, actually, it was considered a compliment to be called a cow of Bashan, believe it or not. Can you guess why? Well, um, it would be a bit like um, being called the, the Kobe beef <laughs> or the prime <laughs> cut. Maybe that would that, be a better... Uh, 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 reference. Uh, the, the cows of Bashan were known throughout the, the, the whole region. There was actually a, a shot from the Golan Heights where Bashan was located. Uh, from time, ancient of days, these were the best cows, uh, uh, high, most highly bred in Israel. They had the best meat, they ate the best foods, and drank the purest water. And so to say, to refer to women as the cows of Bashan, it was to say, you well bred women. These were the upper crust. Uh, the wealthy women um, who he's referring to. And the fact that Amos is addressing women actually is a point of some at least modest encouragement in the sense that prophets, Israelite prophets rarely addressed women directly. Um, it's a patriarchal society. But um, Amos seems to have the opinion that um, women are just as, uh, uh, play just as a prominent role in, well, the problems that are going on, but also may play a prominent role in the solutions. It would have been easy in Amos's day for a woman to say, oh, these problems you're talking about, well, it's a man's world. You know, I, you know what can I do? Amos seems to be saying, actually, there's a lot <laughs> uh, you can do. But what were those problems? Well, that's what we'll be getting into uh, in, into our, in, in our episode. We're going to invite uh, Ian Lynch, actually, to, to read uh, our central passage tonight, which comes from Amos chapter 5, uh, verses 21 through 27, we're going to start our NUMA reading and then invite Frank Schaefer into the conversation as we kind of process this passage together. Uh, what were the problems that Amos is identifying and what are some of the solutions and what does this have to do with our day uh, anyway? Um, but before we get to that, we want to also uh, thank you very profoundly. We, In our um, donations um, at Darkwood Brew, we've just passed over the $20,000 mark. We have a $25,000 matching grant, so there's 5000 more we can actually... Uh, receive and it will be doubled um, dollar for dollar. So thank you for bringing us up over that 20,000 mark and uh, let's hit that 25 uh, uh, and, uh, and complete that matching grant. Well, uh, Matt, I want to introduce the band and we'll, we'll uh, transition into our NUMA reading. Yeah, in tonight's episode we're going to do uh, some Chuck Moronic pieces. One of them is called What Have You Done? The other one's called A Drop of Water and Chuck's lovely wife Mary Ann also helped him co-write that one. Introducing the band quickly, Dan Cerveny on the keyboards, Carlos Figueroa on the drums, Steve Gomez on the bass. Here we go, fellas. One, two, three. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sakuth, your king, and Kaiwan, your star god, your images, 
which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will take you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Pretty heady passage uh, there. Uh, yeah, that reference to uh, uh, Sukkoth and Kaiwan actually were, uh, those were both astral deities. They were the equivalent of that flying spaghetti monster, actually. And uh, we're going to invite uh, Frank now to join us. And uh, let's talk about this passage a little. Let's process it a bit. Uh, Frank, are you there? I am here. All right. Well, good to see you with us again tonight. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Hey, by the way, before the episode began, I was uh, uh, hearing that there are people on, on chat were uh, wondering, uh, they've seen that artwork bef behind you, and we're wondering where that comes from. Are you an art collector or what? Well, you're, I'm sitting in my office studio. You know, I, I paint. So these are all things of mine. And I'm looking around. I probably have 50 or 60 paintings in here. Um, I paint the marsh that I see out my window here in Massachusetts on the Merrimack River. And then basically what grows in my garden. You know, back in the day before I got into being an evangelical sidekick to my famous evangelical father, Francis Schaeffer, when we were in the religious right days, uh, and, and busy persecuting bad liberals like you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> we would have persecuted right back if we had the opportunity. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We had more guns, though. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> you, got, you guys are very lightly armed. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> no contest, you know. But no. anyway, yeah, so I, I, I painted very seriously back then, and then I dropped it for many years uh, after I left the evangelical community, began writing books like my novels, uh, Portofino, Saving Grandma, Zermatt, Baby Jack, all that stuff. Then about seven years ago, unpacked some old paints and found the oils were still fresh, believe it or not, after a 25 year plus hi hiatus and got back into it. So now I'm actually putting together a show that will be um, in California sometime in about six months. So I'm, 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 I'm sort of seriously getting down to it here and, and working every day a bit as well as with my writing, picking up where I left off a long time ago, but doing very different work. Yeah, great. Well, Frank, um, you know, when we look at that, that, that passage in Amos uh, to take chapter 5 and really take a, a number of references throughout Amos, we find you know, that, that the people that he's addressing, they're certainly no religious slackers. They're not um, sleeping in on Sunday mornings, so to speak, in, and, and sleeping through church or, uh, you know, again, so to speak. Um, right. They are uh, actually very fervently involved in their faith. They are, they're showing up on, uh, to worship. They are keeping the commandments, they're keeping the Sabbath, they're, they're not only tithing, but they're giving extra offerings, they're uh, right. making sac all the sacrifices, there are at least five of them that are prescribed on a regular basis, um, they're doing all these things, and then Amos says, hey, you know, you guys may as well be worshiping, you know, the ancient Near Eastern equivalent of this spaghetti monster uh, <laughs> right. uh, god. Um, when you look out at um, the religious environment today, do you see anything, any kind of parallels um, in, in our world, fervent faith being practiced, but maybe something that's just so far askew that God might say, hey, you know, that has nothing to do with me? Yeah, well, you know, when it comes to fervency, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if this is original or not, but it's something that I say once in a while, and that is that I think in our culture, sincerity is the most overrated virtue. You know, we, we tend to feel that if people are sincere about their beliefs, oh, well, that's his personal belief, that's her personal belief, they're very sincere uh, people, that kind of lets everybody off the hook. But, of course, when you look at Amos, he's saying uh, sincerity and belief are not the point, let alone r ritual and sacrifice. W what I want is for justice to roll down. And so, you know, it's very much like Christ's teaching, saying, you know, in the, in the final analysis, what matters is the content of your character and what you actually do, you know, as in the parable of the Good Samaritan, no doubt the religious sincerity of the priests who passed by on the other side of the road was intact. They just hadn't connected their belief to action that could be measured. And so it's interesting that Amos seems to fit in with the tradition of teaching that then reemerges in the New Testament that says, more or less what I just said. Sincerity is the most overrated virtue, and so is feeling you're a chosen person, which we were talking about in previous programs together, the sense of entitlement, 
and being chosen and selected as, as the Jews or Christians or Americans or whatever. So I think it kind of revolves around that, that your sincerity, your, your, your virtue of showing up for religious ceremonies is not the point. The content of your character is the point. Who you really are is the point. And moreover, most especially in the context of this passage in justice, what you do for other people is the point. And so I guess you could even go this far. You know, from God's point of view, if Amos is correct, I don't presume to know what God's point of view is, if any, on these things. But if Amos is correct, you get the idea that God would much prefer an atheist who has no belief or sincerity and could care less about these issues, but is the person to stop by in the role of the Good Samaritan wherever that occurs uh, and do something. So, you know, I guess you could say, what's better, a church-going Christian who is, you know, taking care of their church and, and helping in the community and showing up and sincere and leading Bible studies or someone who's a total atheist and from the church's point of view, absolutely outside and outsider and the other, but who yet actually is someone who not only serves the community, but does so in a sacrificial way for, for which they get no credit. Uh, you know, like the widow giving all she had, the two mites. So I, I think that's the kind of tension we see in the passage. I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but those are some things I see there. Yeah, it makes sense. And of course, if the choice is only between those two, it seems pretty clear which one God would uh, prefer is the, the, the latter. Right. I'm curious, though, you know, here we've kind of put our finger on this the central piece that's, that's disturbing God, according to Amos, that people are not doing justice. They're not letting it run like an ever-flowing stream in righteousness. Uh, right. Uh, and incidentally, uh, in, in Israel, streams don't, tend to flow in an ever-flowing mm -hmm. way. They're seasonal um, because it's the desert, and so they, they flow when the rains come, but then they stop when the, when the sun's out and, and it's not raining. But, and Amos is saying, hey, you need to do this. Your justice and righteousness needs to be an ever-flowing stream, not just in season. But it, right. se it seems that um, you know, most people, wouldn't they um, acknowledge, like if they're, if they're truly sincere believers, wouldn't they acknowledge that justice and righteousness you know, are, are good things, um, why, why would they divert from doing those very things? Well, I guess the passage is not addressing the kind of people who do that. It's addressing those of us who at one time or another let the beliefs that we have and our sense of uh, belonging to our religious community actually get in the way of doing justice. You know, I, I lived in South Africa for a year in the late 1980s, uh, just before Nelson Mandela got out of prison, I was making a couple of feature films over there and in, in South Africa and Namibia. And, you know, I, I met a number of reformed people, reformed in the Calvinist sense, who were very much the kind of folks that, you know, I come out of in terms of my background. And they, they, they certainly were church-going people. They had all their their I's dotted and their T's crossed and they did all the things you're supposed to do. The only trouble is that they were running an apartheid state hmm. and actually far from their faith helping them, they saw justification within their concept of being a chosen people, which by the way, the Dutch East India Company and the settlers who went out there had the same ideas our Puritan forefathers did as the Israelites did. Didn't do them any good. I, it kind of took them away from justice more than it helped them. So. I guess the kind of self-righteous pietism that you see in so many religious circles, uh, Christian and otherwise, it isn't just Christians, mm -hmm. you know, there's a tremendous danger in thinking that you're right about things. Uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of humility of leaving these theological questions open-ended, a more agnostic approach, mm -hmm. or at least an approach, the faith that sees faith as a journey which does not end, you know, kind I think tends to breed a, a mentality where you, you, you finish more sentences, at least in your own head, but I could be wrong. That leaves a door open, I think, to helping people more than if you're absolutely sure that, you know, as Christ put it, if you've tithed your cumin and dill seed and you've got your, all your thing, ducks in a row, then y you're home free. So I don't, see, I don't see Amos's passage as anything unusual. I think it's part of the entire structure 
of Scripture in this warning yeah. against against piety. It, it, I mean, it's like Jesus. You know, every time he talks about the Torah, he seems to be denying something in the Torah and saying, well, the law says this, but that's not the point. Here's what I'm telling you. So I think it's the same kind of thing. It's like, I don't want your sacrifices. I don't care what your rituals are, your laws, your piety, what you do in church every Sunday. That never was the point. Um, let's, let's look at what the point really is. Yeah. You know, that, that makes sense from my perspective. And I, I think back you know, to you know, Jesus seems to have made a, a very similar point in the sense also that, that he wasn't against simply the, the, the sinners. He was against actually the self-righteous more than anything else. That The biggest beef right. he has is with the self-righteous. And it seems that, that you know, we kind of have a choice. We can either kind of worship and serve a power higher than ourselves, or we can worship and serve ourselves. There's not really... There's kind of one or the other, and when we get all self-righteous, we ended up actually we end up worshiping ourselves, and but throwing this nice pietistic God overlay on it. But we're really doing just whatever the hell we want. But you do. know, it, it isn't just. I mean, I know that we Christians are very good at beating ourselves up and a, a, almost a false humility there, of pointing out how uh, you know how we fail. But actually, when you look at the secular world around you, it's interesting. I was reading an article on Alternet that I write for once in a while. It's a pretty liberal site, a left-wing site. And in, in the context of the first program, when we were talking about Facebook and Google and these other people who aren't doing enough about human trafficking, here was another issue. I mean, he was talking about the fact that there's this, this movie coming out that was all shot in Google and it makes them look very cool. But what, one thing Google doesn't tell you is that their security guards, their janitors, their groundskeepers, their bus drivers, um, most of them are contracted to the lowest bidder subcontractors that don't give these guys benefits. So if you are a Google genius, mm -hmm. you know, you're so clever, you're one of the chosen, you're one of the few, you're brilliant, you can skateboard around the office and get free sushi and all the perks. If you're just the guy watching the door, good luck. You're getting, you know, minimum wage of 15 bucks an hour, no chance of advancement and no health insurance if you're part of a private contract. So this idea of you know, piety, mm -hmm. Google saying, you know, do no evil, we're special, we're not going to be like other corporations. It isn't just Christians, and it's certainly not just evangelicals, and it's certainly yeah. not just religion. It's anybody who's in a position of power and success, but also feeling, well, we've arrived. Right. You know, we're, we're, we're the future of America. We've made the economy revive. We're brilliant. We're writing all these things where other people poke around and do little insignificant jobs. We're the big special people. Talk to the gardener. He doesn't even have health insurance. Yeah. It's a, it's a two-tier system. Total justice if you're brilliant, injustice if you don't count yeah. and are replaceable. And that's right now in San Francisco where the housing market is collapsing for anybody except the upper class because these multimillionaire internet folks have, have taken over the city and basically made no room for the working poor and in their own companies are hiring subcontractors and contracting out. So where's all the idealism of save the world, connect everybody? Yeah, but not when it costs us a buck. Yeah, you know, and, and I would actually uh, uh, kind of grab a piece of that action uh, from the progressive sphere too in terms of it's not, yeah, you, as you rightly point out, it's not just evangelical Christians who are so self-righteous that they're doing whatever the, what they want. It's also, you know, the, right. maybe the Google mobiles and who knows what their faith background is. But I'd also say from, from the camp that I originated in, the, the liberal, liberal progressive camp, um, there is a certain form of progressivism that has, you know, accepted, you know, the decon we, we deconstruct the scripture. We see that, you know, there, there are things that, you know, don't necessarily, didn't necessarily happen the way they are said and, and so right. forth. And we've embraced science and all these things. But, but um, what we've essentially done in the progressive community, there's, there's a certain element that is progressive in the sense of let's deconstruct everything uh, so that, because they're not doing that because they're necessarily wanting to get at the truth of the truth and become right. more faithful, it's more like, don't you go telling me what the heck to believe or, or to do. You know, I'm my own person and, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm independent of it all. You know, so, yeah, I'm going to deconstruct everything because it just kind of, I mean, this isn't a conscious thing I think most people do, but you know, let's just kind of bring it all down because it, then it uplifts because now we're doing whatever the hell we want, you know, <laughs> basically. Yeah. You know, don't tell me anything. Um, well, you know, that, that kind of libertarian disease, because yeah. it is one. I mean, you can be a lot of things if you're a Christian. I know this will shock some people. And I don't mean this in the sense of a political party. 
But in the true sense of libertine, libertarian, I, Ayn Rand, you know, you can do a lot of things. You can vote on a lot of sides of issues. You can be for George Bush or, or Obama and still love Jesus. But one thing I don't think you can do, all kidding aside, is be a libertarian in the sense of saying, hey, you're not my problem. You know, we're not, I'm not paying taxes to help anybody, and I don't want laws curtailing what I can do. My freedom is all that counts. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly, I mean, I, you can read the Old Testament and the New Testament a lot of ways. I don't think a libertarian view of don't tread on me shakes out no matter how you slice it. Yeah, yeah. And I'll just also point out, just to kind of contribute that progressive thread and criticize my own community I come from, <laughs> you know, the one line in all of Amos that, that we know, in fact, it's really one of the about two lines in the entire Old Testament that we, we cite over and over again, is that, you know, that, that really important line is Amos 5.24, where he says, you know, right. let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. But we take that to mean that that's all that's really important. All this worship stuff, all this tithing stuff, all this, you know, this, this honoring the Sabbath stuff, that's all just BS. You know, that, that's all just right. frivolous because that's all that God really cares about is justice. Um, when, you know, Paul makes a similar move to this in 1 Corinthians 13, when he says, you know, if, you know, I can have faith as to, re to remove mountains even and give my body away to, um, and, so that I could boast, and, and yet if I don't have love, I have nothing. And yet we don't sit around saying, well, it's not important to have faith. I mean, better to have both of those things, to have I mean, the worship life and the giving, the sac sacrificial giving, the, the faithfulness, that all, um, it, uh, that actually creates a container through which justice and righteousness can be uh, formed yeah. and informed. Well, you know, when you look at the intense secular self-righteousness that surrounds us now, they've sort of replaced the pietistic paradigm with coolness. If you're cool and you're the future, then you are exempt from what obligations other people have. You know, like the folks who tell me that they're spiritual but not religious. And, you know, my question to them always is a very practical one. Then where do you do community? And I mean that in a two-way sense. How, how, how are you aware that, you know, Anna Mamakis, who does the dishes with you at the food festival, now has a health problem because you never see her? Mm -hmm. and, how are, and, and when you're alone and you've lost your parent or a child or whatever it may be, you know, where, where do you turn? Uh, you know, Twitter is not going to solve this for you. So... I think that where it all falls apart is whether it's you think you're one of the cool people, the rock star mentality that actual rock stars sometimes suffer from, but more often than not, other people too who just think that they're above not just the law, but hey, who, you know, who needs spirituality? I, I, I think you know, spirituality is always about communing with God through the way we communicate with other people. When you take that out of the mix, then we wait for some NGO to solve everything for us. We just give corporate donation. But in our personal lives, whether it's our relationships or how we treat the guys who have subcontracted out the security detail to while all our geniuses are making millions, or whether it's uh, the, the more liberal wing of Protestantism that deconstructs the scripture down to the point where there's no, teach, there's no moral instruction and teaching or there, there, and they just sort of take a little bit of such social justice trimmings off, you know, or whether it's the fundamentalist who says, if you don't toe the line on all my fundamentalist theology, you're out. It actually all comes out the same, because mm -hmm. what it leaves you is, is an isolated individual in judgment of other people, feeling you don't need anybody, and, and, and basically you become you know, your own little God. So I think that that's sort of the loop that ties all, all these manifestations together. Yeah. And, it, and in some way, I think we all suffer from it. I mean, yeah. in our daily lives. I don't think anybody's exempt. I know I certainly am not and, and tend to, you know, be quite self-centered and selfish. Fortunately, because I do go to church, I mean, in all seriousness, as I did this morning with my little granddaughter, Lucy, and my grandson, Jack, again, it happens to be a Greek Orthodox church. You know, one of the things that happens in Greek Orthodox churches, as happens in your church, is the gospel is read whether you want to hear it or not. And so are other passages. And once in a while, these things, just like your passages here, break through. Because it, a lot of the time, this is an unwelcome message because it rattles your, you know, sense of composure and you feel challenged. If you take the liberal approach and deconstruct all of it, or the secular approach and say none of it matters, or the fundamentalist approach that says, I already have the truth, so I don't need to listen. All three of those versions, you come out at the same place. But if you allow yourself to be shaken up a little bit by what you hear and see in terms of the needs of other people in a community, 
then I think faith itself becomes the key to the social justice and all these fruits you want, without which nobody's really motivated to do any of this stuff. And of course, that's a huge argument with atheists and agnostics. But I think on the record, you know, you take the faith-based community out of the world, and yes, a lot of damage has been done, but I haven't seen any, any St. Voltaire hospitals. You know, I see a lot of St. Luke's hospitals. Mm. I see a lot of Sisters of Charity things. I have yet to see one, you know, that has been dedicated to one of the great paragons of secular thought. Mm -hmm. The truth is, when faith is taken out of the mix, all these other good things tend to fade away. Yeah. And a you, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ways to argue that. That's no proof that God is there. But I think as a sociological truth, that's a truth. Yeah. Uh, sociologically, I remember uh, Jesse Jackson once uh, Commenting that if you're in an alley uh, in, a, at a dark, in a dark, dark alley at night and a group of, of, uh, of males is kind of coming down the alley towards you, um, are you more stressed or less if you, find, if you were to know that they just came out of a Bible study? Yeah, and I think that's a great point. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, and I'll, I'll make it more personal. You know, I think my wife is less stressed knowing that on Sunday I wander out of yeah. church having been reminded that, uh, you know, we're trying to live according to some standard besides just what I want. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, now that we've, we've uh, successfully made everybody uncomfortable. Uh, I'm, I'm relieved. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chris is saying she's relieved. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, we're going to uh, continue on with our Numa Divina. We've, we've hit one passage of that, and, and Frank has helped us kind of explore the overall gist of the passage. We're going to read it now uh, 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 three more times in a, in a more meditative uh, setting. And we just in encourage you to um, kind of, uh, you may want to close your eyes, you may want to bring them into soft focus, or just simply um, look at the screen as we cycle this passage um, you know, around um, over and again. And uh, we'll kind of give you instructions for what to look for, what to kind of suggestions about what to do during that. But this, is, uh, this ancient format is really about trying to shake loose insights uh, that come uh, from deep within us and some would say are connected to the, the Holy Spirit. As you hear this, this, um, this now second reading of scripture, we invite you to simply to um, pay attention to what word or phrase you feel drawn to. Simply what, any word or phrase, a particular word or phrase that you feel particularly drawn to. You don't have to know why, it just may jump out at you. When, when you find that phrase over the next a minute or so, just simply let that phrase or that word turn in your mind and think about every iteration of that phrase or word that you can find in your life. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sakuth, your king, and Kaiwan, your star god, your images, which, they made, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will take you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts.
as you hear the passage read uh, once more, uh, simply uh, take that phrase or that word that you've isolated and ask yourself, what question or challenge does it pose to you this evening? What is it pointing to within your own life that's asking questions, challenging, or pointing out insight? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sekuth, your king, and Kaiwan, your star god, your images, which you made for yourselves. Therefore I will take you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord whose name is the God of hosts. As you hear the passage read this one last time, uh, it'll just simply uh, be read and take us into our musical feature. We encourage you simply to uh, stay in that meditative state as long as you feel so moved. Uh, let that passage swirl around, let that word or phrase swirl around, uh, continuing to provoke uh, you in whatever way uh, it will. I hate, I despise your festivals and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sekuth, your king, and Kaiwan, your star god, your images, which you made for yourselves. Therefore I will take you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts.
Chuck and Mary Ann Moronic tune. That was just Chuck. Oh, that, 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 that's yeah, right. The next, next one, one is Chuck. That's right. Uh, drop of Water. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, great to have uh, Frank back with us. And we want to uh, get your reaction also uh, from the chat community and also from the coffee house. If you have uh, comments or uh, questions um, uh, just, or simply responses to that NUMA reading, uh, we'd love to hear uh, it all. So, um, uh, Chris, did you, anything surface from the internet yet? Um, the main discussion has been about the connection between the action and the commitment to Christ. I mean, the, the whole, or God, the whole idea that your belief and your actions are tied together in some form of covenant, some form of commitment, some form of integrity is one of the words that they used. And they gave a couple examples of, of that kind of self-watching of yourself to kind of lead you into that humility. One was... Uh, the complaint wall at Wild Goose last year that turned mm. out that when they took all the complaints off, there were mirrors there. So it yeah. was you that made the difference. And Mark Davis suggested something he had done recently in his congregation. Um, he said that he had tea lights all over the communion table. And when people came up for bread and wine, they took the candle. Um, and they were invited to sit at every table where they sat with others throughout the week. Hmm. As a kind of an extension of the table out into the community so that they realized that... It's all part of the same. Mm, wonderful. I love that sense of connectedness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as you were mentioning that, that um, kind of covenanted relationship, I was thinking about a comment that the uh, sociologist, Christian sociologist Tex Sample once made uh, when he said that, uh, you know, we take a lot of pride, many, many of us, to say, you know, I'm outside the tradition. I don't have a, a tradition. Yeah. Um, you know, that spiritual but not religious kind of uh, idea. Uh, but, you know, as Tex, as a, a student of, sociology uh, noted that whenever we stand outside of a tradition, what normally happens sociologically is we adopt whatever the dominant uh, culture says is the tradition, which in America is consumeristic utilitarianism. Right. You know, and so you just kind of buy, you know, if you're outside of any kind of connectedness to a community and a tradition, that's basically the default that we, that we wind up into, even though we pride ourselves in being, you know, kind of independent and above it all. 
And Frank, I think that that connection that you made earlier about that's all great and well that you're spiritual but not religious, but then where do you go when you need help? Where's your connection to the community? How does the community help you out of those kinds of situations? Kind of touched the nerve and that, that's mm -hmm. where the conversation started swirling. So, yeah. Any, any reactions to that, Frank? Yeah, well, you know, I think it, I, I, I talked a little while ago about being in Africa for a year and one, one, one thing that really struck me was we were out in the Namibian desert and we, we had a, a film location for a long time next to a big tr troop of baboons that were living on a cliff and, and, and uh, watching how badly behaved, by the way, primates are kind of reflected, you know, made me think about human behavior because we're not so far distant. But mm. I, I think there's a myth. Individualism is a myth. Mm. And it is a myth because human primates are by evolutionary design and in fact tribal creatures so it's like people who leave their families well then they wind up in the 1960s in Haight Asbury in San Francisco putting together little communes and doing new units but they never actually got away from uh, a, a, a structure in which you're not alone and it's the same thing with people who do something individualistic or libertarian or whatever it is you know, this lasts for about two minutes, and then you're always looking for someone to do this with. And, and so I just think one of the things that, you know, maybe as you get a little older, I, don't, I wouldn't go so far as to call it wisdom, maybe just you get tired, which is kind of the same thing. But <laughs> <laughs> you, realize, Very wise you, rea tonight. you realize, yeah, you realize that actually all these kind of cries of individualism I just do my own spirituality. You know, if this was the case, then why would there be shelf after shelf after shelf or on Kindle thousands of lift listings of books on spirituality telling you how to do this individually? Hmm. I mean, think about it. You know, it, you're, you're looking for a, a community. You're looking for a tradition. You're looking for people to affirm what you believe so that, <clears throat> you know, the fundamentalist quote, stuck with the Bible and trying to live by it, is in no different place than the, the, either the secular person or the liberal person or the new age person or the, or the unbelieving person or whomever it may be who talks just about having a, a, a kind of a free form spirituality. They just do their own thing because no one does. Everybody is in relationship with other people. We, we form new communities if we break old ones. Um, you know, you, you talk to somebody who runs away from home at 14, the next thing you know, they're, they're living under a bridge with six other 14-year-olds having put together their own family again. And I think it's exactly the same thing in this area of spirituality. So for me personally, I like to be part of a tradition without playing this game that I'm doing it all by myself. Right. And that, that applies to family structure. It applies to all sorts of things. So yeah. I, don't see, I don't see in reality that this is even an option. I think it's a pretense and it's a delusion, but it's not a real option. And no one that I personally know, and I've had pretty broad connections with people, has ever actually done this. They just say they're doing it and then they go off and make their own communities or invent a new tradition that really plugs into other traditions and pretty soon they're right back where they started. So right, yeah. I, I don't even think it's an option. Yeah, I'm reminded of a, a poet that, uh, whose name escapes me, but David White, the poet, uh, cites him who uh, quotes his poet, poem as something like, uh, you, know what, you want to know why you're miserable? And of course, the implied answer is yes. <laughs> and right. he says, I'll tell you why you're, you're miserable. It's because 99.998% of everything you do is for you, mm -hmm. and there is no you. Right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, questions from the internet? Well, we, uh, yeah, I, th I think that um, that connectedness you know, piece is, is huge. Not that, of course, of course, the opposite is following, you know, just kind of being sheep that follow this herd mentality and just doing whatever the group wants, too. I don't, well, you I know, don't look, know that's look, what you're, you're saying. Yeah, but I mean, look at Twitter, Facebook, all, all the social media. I mean, everybody's an individual on their own. So what do they do? They all hook up via social media. Now they're, now they're you know, they're staring down a little screen, staying even more connected to the human tribe in a different form. But if you think this is freedom, you're crazy. Because of course it's 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 another form of connectedness. There, you know, there are no individuals out there. They're all they're all 
We all are in a herd mentality. So the best thing to do is just admit you're a sheep and choose which herd you want to be part of. <laughs> uh, choose what, what, what uh, herd you're going to be a part of. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. Frank, we want to uh, uh, we appreciate your joining our herd uh, tonight, or us joining yours, and um, we look forward to having you back with us again uh, next week as we look specifically at we've kind of been looking at the role of the religion in all this, uh, and we'll be looking at the role of politics and the state uh, next week, and uh, so we look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, me too, and I enjoy this. Thanks a lot for having me on, and everybody there, and the band, and the whole bit. So it's great. Thanks. We uh, uh, want to uh, we climax every episode of Darkwood Brew with the ritual of, of communion. So, if, and if we invite you to participate with us with bread and wine at home or juice and crackers if you have it. Uh, but before we do, we want to actually uh, take one step out to a uh, text sample. Actually, a story he tells that's been provided to us by the Living the Questions folks from a DVD they call Tex Mix, and uh, Tex actually puts his finger upon. Uh, how being part of a tribe uh, or a flock um, can really make a difference, particularly um, when uh, that flock um, points you um, out, of, out of yourself um, into a new place. Let's hear uh, from Tex Sample telling a story about no flies on Jesus. I have a friend named Jimmy Hope Smith who grew up in South Alabama. Jimmy Hope did seminary and then did a PhD in aesthetics. And because he's out of South Alabama and because of where he raised, he was raised, he talks like this. He's a smart boy, but one of them professors in the East Coast University told him he had to learn to talk like an educated man. Well, it just sunk it in him like steel. He determined he weren't never going to talk no different, no way, no how. So he talks this way to this day. Now, he's got a daddy that he loves just a whole lot. And uh, his daddy still lives in Alabama, and he ain't redeemed in some serious ways. And Jimmy Hope knows that, but he loves his daddy. At his daddy's house, when you visit the TV set, it always goes on first thing in the morning when somebody pushes that button. And it goes off the last thing at night when everybody goes to bed. And all day long, what you do is sit in front of that TV set. You eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner in front of it. You take naps in front of it. You have conversation in front of it. You entertain company in front of it. There is one sacred hour when, as the world turns, is on. Nobody talks. One day, Jimmy Hope and his daddy are sitting in front of TV, having a wonderful conversation when the face of Jesse Jackson comes on the screen. And Jimmy Hope's daddy says, That SOB, somebody ought to just shoot him. Oh, well, daddy, you really believe that? You think somebody ought to shoot Jesse Jackson? I do, they ought to just shoot him. Well, daddy, if you really believe that, I think you ought to go to church Sunday, and I think you ought to pray for somebody to shoot Jesse Jackson. Boy, what's the matter with you? Are you crazy? No, Daddy, I just think if you really believe that, you ought to pray for it. Boy, you know good and well Jesus ain't going to put up with that shit. You see what Jimmy Hope knows? Is Jimmy Hope knows that if you're going to argue with his daddy, you can't argue the way he learned to argue at the university. You got to talk about people that his daddy loves and admires. And for Jimmy Hope's daddy, there ain't no flies on Jesus. <laughs> Great story. That actually uh, ties into our, our Hebrew passage this evening. We made reference to that, those star gods, uh, Kaiwan and Sakuth, that are the ancient Near Eastern equivalent of the flying spaghetti monster. Um, if you look at the Hebrew, I mean, they've actually um, corrected the language in the English translations to, to make them correspond to the actual ancient gods. But in the Hebrew, the, the consonants are the same in Sukkoth and Kaiwan, but the vowels are different. The Hebrews actually replace the vowels with the vowels from the Hebrew word for the, basically the, as close as you get to shit. 
uh, as, uh, they, they, couldn't, they didn't even want to pronounce the name of those, those gods, so they replaced them with those, those vowels. Uh, kind of Amos's kind of sense of humor probably going on underneath the text there. Uh, but bottom line, um, the point is, is very much the same, that in this community, as we're all a sheep of some flock, um, I think that the, the way forward, the way to keep justice flowing and righteousness like ever-flowing streams, is if we would actually treat um, those who receive our labors in the world or their, our energies as if they are the founders of our faith, uh, the leaders of our flock. A Christian treats others as if that person is Jesus. A Jew treats that other person as if they are Muhammad, I mean, <laughs> or Abraham, or, or, or Moses. Um, a, a Muslim treats a, a recipient of their labors as if they are Muhammad. This bottom line is that really clar clarifies uh, what actions are truly just and righteous and what are just plain. Well, you can fill in the blanks. In uh, this ritual of communion, um, it really kind of brings that all together. So we're reminded that when we ourselves, the, as the world, um, uh, put Jesus on a cross, um, that he looked at us and he treated us um, as he himself would wish to be treated. Not lashing out in anger, not seeking to destroy us utterly. But rather, he said, my friends, this is my body which is now broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. And so likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we remember Christ's death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection. And we come to know that at any moment of our own journey, that in taking the, these elements into ourselves, that God's, uh, that Christ's body and blood are mingled uh, with our own, we can expect and should demand, uh, really, that other people treat us um, with the respect and dignity that we would treat Christ. And, we, and they should demand of us that we do the same for them. In so doing, the world becomes redeemed. In so doing, we all come to know what it is like uh, to experience forgiveness and grace, and a love that truly loves us beyond our wildest imagination. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to join us in the feast.
The words to those, that, that song you just heard is, uh, like a drop found in the sea, I live in you, you live in me. And if you are, uh, uh, have been with us in this Darkwood Brew community, uh, we also, you know, we live in you and you live in us in a special way as well. And, and together uh, we become, uh, little by little, uh, learn what it's like to be part of the true body of Christ. Well, we hope you can uh, join us next week as well as we continue this very provocative study of the book of Amos and contemporary life with Frank Schaefer. Until then, my friends, may the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to push you into places you may not necessarily go yourself, go beneath you to uphold you and uplift you, Go beside you to be your strong companion and dwell within you to remind you that you are surely not alone. You are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you now and always. Amen. Amen.